Now we move on to globalization theory, which defines what globalization is itself. So, within globalization theory, there are those who believe that globalization is a new and real phenomena, and there are also those who deny its existence, and they believe instead that we are still in a later stage of modernity. So they are like postmodernity theorists or postmodern social theorists, but they are not talking about the breaking down of barriers. Rather, they're talking about the world becoming increasingly interconnected. So this would be the globalizers and the skeptics, and they're of course on two opposing sides. So the globalizers argue that there is a growing global economy which is transcending nations and providing the motor force of change. So they tend to be the new version of the modernization theorists, while the skeptics, on the other hand, are critical of this. The skeptics argue that there is much more economic interdependence by individual states today than globalizers would acknowledge, and they say that there is not much real convergence of state policies across the globe. In fact, real inequalities across nations have actually increased. So skeptics are like the new version of dependency theorists to globalizers who are like the new version of modernization theorists. So now we can also compare. The materialist perspective versus the idealist perspective、um, among globalization theorists, because they tend to look at different types of epistemology to prove whether globalization really does exist as a new phenomenon. So, under the category of materialists or those who bear some resemblance to Marx's ideas, you have people like Leslie Sclair, Castells, Giddens, and Waters. So for Scler, he looks at the evidence that there is a change in production and investment, and Castells looks at the network society or how networks can span、uh, across nation states, across entire regions.、Uh, there are social movements that could span across these regions, and then you have the spatial temporalists who believe in the compression of space and time, such as Giddens. Who look at the geographic reach of social relations, and of course you have Malcolm Waters, who also believed that globalization covers three main dimensions: economic, cultural, and political. And you also have the idealists, if you recall Weber's ideas, where he believed in understanding the meanings behind actions and looking at intangible types of evidence. So, if you recall, Robertson talked about the phenomenology of knowing that the world is interconnected. So there is heightened public consciousness of global connections, but also waters. Although he does look at three dimensions. So in going back a little bit to Robertson, according to Waters, social change is now proceeding rapidly, and just as postmodernism was the main concept of the 1980s, globalization may be the concept of the third millennium, so to speak. And most social scientists seem to accept that there is such a process. Controversies that appear to surround globalization include the question of whether all Marxist or even structural functionalist theories can be adapted to explain globalization, or do we need to construct entirely new arguments within the sociological canon? So, in Malcolm Waters' book itself,、um, Robertson was featured as a key figure in the formalization and specification of the concept of globalization. And as we covered earlier, Robertson began writing with an interest in linking the functionalist concept of modernization to an international context. If you recall, there is like the four agents in the international system of states. And of course, initially Robertson identified the nation state as a basic unit of analysis, but later on he transcended that to look at the international system of states and patterns of culture. So let us now come to the key debates in the issue of whether globalization exists. And just as Waters mentioned, there are three main dimensions: economic, cultural, and political. So we'll also go by these dimensions. And the theorists, not necessarily sociologists, but a variety of theorists that fall under these categories. So the major debates that revolve around globalization as a whole include、um, questions such as: Is globalization an entirely new phenomenon? Is it at all the same as、um, colonization、uh, or imperialism, mainly by the European powers、um, a few centuries ago? So you have theorists such as Omae who talk about how we are now living in a borderless world, 
And you have Castell, who talks about how we are living in the information age, which brings people closer together because it's easier to find information, for example, online. And you have Giddens, who talks about how globalization is actually the end stage of modernity, the tail end, so to speak, and it's just a radicalization of modernity or an intensification. But you also have those who question globalization, like economists Hearst and Thompson, because for them there was an international system of uh, states that um, traded within the scope of international economics even before the Great Depression. And there are also those who look at the political dimension, such as Hoffman, who talks about how there are limits to global politics because uh, global politics can only influence politics within the nation state. Um, to some extent, but of course the nation state's own politics also plays a part. And then you have the second main key, key debate, uh, which covers globalization as a whole, which are what are the factors driving globalization? So for Wallerstein, if you recall, he talked about the world system where there are core, semi periphery, and peripheral nations, and it's this interrelation between these nations which are dependent on each other for raw materials and also for a market to sell their goods that drive this interconnectivity. Then you also have Castells who talks about how information technology or the informational mode of development, or we recall to use a Marxian term, mode of production, this is what drives uh, us closer together in globalization. For Eikenberry, it's US hegemony, and for Apadurai, he views the world as made up of global scapes. You have ethnoscapes, you have media scapes. Basically, these are interconnected regions, which are, it may not stretch across the entire globe, but it stretches across uh, large regions. So, about whether globalization is new and real, Omai talks about the borderless world, where he says that flows of information and economic activity have increased across nation-state borders, and there is a convergence of ideas and tastes driving market demand. So global capital markets drive investment from one country to another, and there is speculation. Meanwhile, Castells talks about the existence of what we call the information age, um, and this is an informational mode of development or production, where technological arrangements through which labour acts upon a matter to generate a product is the way things are done right now. So you have the internet, you have knowledge society, you have knowledge as a kind of commodity. And then you have Giddens, who talked about how time-space distanciation, which means that time and space do not have borders upon us anymore, do not um, basically limit our movement or interconnectivity. And this is just part of late modernity. And that modernity itself is inherently globalizing. And the economists Hearst and Thompson are skeptical of globalization. For them, globalization is a myth because there is not enough evidence to prove that it's different from uh, international system of trade in the past. And they cite the lack of transnational corporations or TNCs and a definition of what is a global as opposed to international economy. So they talk about something called real-time trade, where if it's truly global, then everything done at the click of a button can immediately have an impact, regardless of where you are in the world. And of course, there is Hoffman, who talk about the reach of global politics, where he said that institutions of global governance remain weak, and citizenship within individual nation-states still remain as important as it was. So what would be the implications for sociology, given all these developments? So Castells outlined the network society. Beck talked about how we're all living in a risk society where the entire mode of production is based on calculating how to reduce risk. While Held and McGrew talk about the future and dimensions of globalization, more in a political dimension. So let's come to the first fear or the first dimension of globalization, which is economic globalization. So the main debate here is, to what extent have we seen the emergence of a global economy? So that will be the debate and uh, the ontologies by the different theorists would be that Castells believe that there is a global economy in real time, as mentioned earlier. That means um, things can happen immediately, regardless of where you are across the globe. Sclare believed that there are transnational corporations and global capitalism as a new system. And Hearst and Thompson, on the other hand, of course, they are skeptical and they said this process is called internationalization rather than globalization. 
while he, on the other hand, insisted that it's not globalization, but more of a regional integration. And so to what extent have we seen the emergence of a global economy? For Castells, he says that over the last 30 years, a new global economy has emerged. The difference between global and international economy is that a global economy operates in real time. It has core components that have the institutional, organizational, and technological capacity to work as a unit in real time, any chosen time, on a planetary scale. So several core features of the global economy include global financial markets, international trade, and international production. Sclair, meanwhile, believes that there is a changing nature of capitalism from the 1960s, where it has transformed itself from an international to a global system. So transnational corporations, or TNCs, are the key actors responsible for this, because they bring together sellers, intermediaries, and buyers into a single transnational network of production, which dominates the global economy. And the capitalist global system is the result of several agents here, which are the transnational corporations, and the transnational capitalist class who populate these corporations at the top of it, and the culture ideology of consumerism, which makes us want to buy more. For Hurst and Thompson, the skeptics, they're highly skeptical that the international economy has radically changed, because they challenge the evidence that there is such a thing as a globalized economy. For them, the evidence of increasing foreign trade and investment is not enough to prove that we are now in a so-called new global age. For them, before World War I, the international economy was more open. And their reasons for this is that during that time, there was international business, there was trade, there was foreign direct investment, and there was migration. Meanwhile, for Colin Hay, he focused on economic trends and economic institutions and said that economic integration is happening at the regional level, but it's not converging towards one single global model of economic growth. So it's not transnational corporations or even ICTs that are causing integration, uh, information communication technologies, but for Colin Hay, it was the EU and the IMF. For him, international trade and capital mobility have significantly increased in recent years. But that doesn't mean that all firms and states operate in one single global economy. So the examples of this regional integration for Hay are, were such as East Asia after 1997 and in Europe after the EU. So one other area in which economic globalization could have taken place is um, in changing the nature of the firm. If you talk about the marketplace and uh, bureaucracies or companies, so has globalization created a new medium of practice? For Peter Dickin, he focuses on the reasons and ways companies expand operations into other countries to answer this question. So there are two reasons for companies to expand operations into other countries, the first being market-oriented investment, where they want to look for overseas markets, and asset-oriented investment, a second one, where they want to look for resources in certain regions. However, national factors prevent convergence towards a single organizational form. These include a nation's cultural, social, political, and economic issues. Hearst and Thompson, our skeptics, focus on national variation in business activity. And they suggested that international firms predate, or they were there already before the era of globalization, and they don't often resemble the ideal type transnational corporation, unlike what Sclair said. So they deny that international businesses are totally a phenomenon of the post World War II world. Because for Hurst and Thompson, multinational corporations or MNCs involved in manufacturing first appeared in the 1850s. After the Great Depression, they were affected, but they grew up again. In the 1950s. So they're not entirely new. And there are several types of international firms for Hearst and Thompson. These include multinational corporations, MNCs, and transnational corporations, TNCs. MNCs are more commonly found, and most of their functions are located in their country of origin, but they have a strong local presence in other countries where they trade. Meanwhile, TNCs are more like specialized units uh, which are located in different parts of the world like the head office is located in one country, production is in a different country, research and development in another country. So these are the two types of organizational structure. Castells also talks about TNCs, and he says that they remain national in some respects, for example, their management origins. And transnational production networks is the major trend that is affecting all major corporations. 
global production of goods and services is not performed by multinationals, but by transnationals. These networks are made up of small and medium-sized firms. These networks are linked to TNCs in that they are subcontractors instead of all being under one roof or internal hierarchy. So they are more flexible that way and hence more globally competitive. Next, you have Clegg and Carter who focus on the ideas that shape firms by looking at the global influence of management schools. So there are so many business and management um, universities or degrees that are particularly high-ranking, and these two have an impact on the way business is done. So for Clegg and Carter, there is homogenization because of this within IT companies, business schools, and such. There are four ways in which these management ideas have spread that also affect the mode of production. The first being IT firms, because companies rely very much on IT infrastructure and the influence spreads out from the IT companies. Number two, management consultancy, who transmit new management practices. Number three, the MBA degree, the Master in Business Administration degree, because the structure of the program is the principal means of training senior managers in large corporations. And number four, management gurus. You'll see them sometimes in um, bookstores. So they, have, they have popular books. Um, and most managers actually don't attend business schools, according to Clegg and Carter, but they read these business guru books. And there is one more called benchmarking, whereas Claire's transnational capitalist class use benchmarking to measure corporation performance. So that's where we have key performance indicators. Or